I'm not used to this, you can see that. The Chancellor, Reverend Sister Joan O'Keefe, the Vice Chancellor and President, Dr. Mary Bluchard, graduates and distinguished guests here at Mount St. Vincent University. First, congratulations, Dr. Mary Bluchard, on your investiture this morning. I wish you a successful term. It's a great honor to be here with you today and to accept the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters alongside great heroes and heroines such as Rosa Parks. I thank you sincerely for this honor. Dear graduates, my heartfelt congratulations to all of you for successfully completing your university courses and receiving your academic degrees. What an achievement. And what an exciting time in your lives. Some of you are about to complete one chapter of your lives and to begin a new one. And some of you are returning to the world of work, perhaps to strike out in new directions. This can be a daunting time. You will have to ask yourself, what do I really want to be? What will I do? Often at this time, people talk about the need to find your place in the world. Well, that's fine. But what if the world does not have a comfortable place for you? What if, like Rosa Parks, your place is in the back of the bus? Then, graduates, you have to choose, like Rosa Parks, to change the world. This great woman, Rosa Parks, once said, I'd like to be known as a person who is concerned about freedom and equality and justice and prosperity for all people. Think of that. Freedom, equality, justice, prosperity for all. You might have heard of a statistic that Oxfam brought out at the beginning of the year. And Professor Jonathan, if I can call you Jonathan, has just mentioned it, that eight men, eight men now own as much wealth as 3.6 billion people, the poorest half of the world. Eight men, and I dare say not even one woman, we now have levels of wealth never seen before in human history, and yet one in nine people go hungry every night. We live in an age of unparalleled consumption for the richest, and it's destroying the planet for all of us. I am angry that we are comfortably accepting these contradictions. We say to ourselves, it's okay, the world is made up of winners and losers. Some people work hard, some are not working hard. Some are rich, some are poor. We justify. This subconscious tolerance of extreme inequality is like a seed that's planted deep in us. But friends, here's the simple and ugly truth. Extreme inequalities that divide us are human-made. And may I even say, man-made. They are the consequence of mistaken beliefs and misguided policies. Inequality is manufactured. I'll tell you a bit about myself. I was born in a village called Ruti, and Jonathan pronounced it right, in a town called Mbarara in southwestern Uganda. I have fond memories we had no electricity in my village, no running water, no TV. I first saw a TV when I was 16. Water was fetched from the river, firewood from the forest. We walked three miles to school and three miles back home. We did our homework by the light of a kerosene lamp. This is not a story of poverty. My parents were school teachers, and that put me ahead of my village friends. 
But I could not understand and I could not accept that I should walk to school in a pair of shoes when my best friends walked barefoot. So, you know, I hid my shoes in my school bag and walked barefoot with them. And you know, all children feel the same way, that inequality is wrong. But as we grow up, we are socialized to accept inequalities and to accept injustices. I'm haunted by the memory of all those girls who dropped out of school, my school, who didn't go past primary school, girls much smarter than myself. Half a century on, it's an outrage that we are in a world of riches, we are in a world of billionaires, but millions of girls from poor families still face the same, denied a chance to reach their full potential. And you know, we all lose out. It's not just them. Just think how many potential astrophysicists, medical and environmental scientists are today herding goats and holding water in villages. Inequality hurts the poor and cheats all of us. But how did we get here? It's not difficult to see. I'll give you an example of women that Oxfam works with in Myanmar. They work in the garment industries there. They are at the bottom of the global supply chain of companies like Gap, like H&M, like Zara, who make the clothes we all wear. These women earn $4 a day. They work six days a week, sometimes seven, sometimes up to 23 hours a day, if they get sick, they don't get paid. If they get pregnant, they're fired. They have no rights, no voice at all at work. And you know, as things stand, most women in poverty will never escape poverty, no matter how hard they work. They bear the brunt of the terrible policies that fuel inequality. Women own 2% of the world's land, but farm and produce, 400 million women farm and produce most of the world's food. Working women still earn 23% less than men in the same jobs. 75% of women in Asia and in Africa are in informal, insecure jobs, like the women of Myanmar. Not much will change for these women unless the structures of our economies change. And do not think that this happens on the other side, far away in the south. No. Here in Canada, you might have seen Oxfam's short-changed campaign, highlighting the plight of workers in the hotel industry, who are mostly women, who work long hours, to make hotel beds, to clean hotel toilets for very low pay. They face intimidation and they live in fear of arbitrary dismissal. Meanwhile, a top earning hotel CEO can earn in one hour, one hour, more than what a housekeeper earns in a whole year. That can't be right. <laughs> The problem of extreme wealth isn't about the ability to buy many houses, to buy a yacht. It's about the ability of the super rich to buy elections, to buy impunity from the law, to buy a pliant media to tell their story, to buy favorable laws. In 2013, the United States financial sector together spent more than $400 million lobbying their politicians on Capitol Hill. And the year before that, they spent $571 million on campaign contributions, buying the politicians. And my friends, wasn't that a good investment for them? The personal wealth 
of US billionaires, half of whom are invested in the financial sector, increased by $94 billion that year. And it's the same everywhere. You know, the US Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis once said, listen to this, you can have democracy or you can have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but you cannot have both. So our governments face a choice and they are constantly making the wrong choice, choosing inequality over democracy. Increasingly, governments are confidently repressive, cracking down on citizens. One organization called Civicus, which is an alliance dedicated to strengthening citizens' rights, tells us that serious threats to civic freedoms exist now in more than 100 countries rich and poor countries alike. So the capture of our politics by rich elites is causing the rise of populism. People are angry. They've lost faith with mainstream politics. All over the world, citizens are anxious and they are looking for a new way. So the time has come for the world to make a decisive break from this reckless and destructive path there's nothing so broken that can't be fixed. At Oxfam, we are optimistic. We never give up. We can choose to end extreme inequality. At Oxfam, we are working with unions, with unlikely partners, with unions, with churches, with mosques, with artists, with women and with young people to halt and reverse extreme inequality, to build an economy for the 99%, not for the 1%. We are campaigning for universal quality health care for everyone, for an education for all our girls and boys. We can afford it. We are the wealthiest ever generation in human history. We are fighting against tax dodging by the Starbucks, the Apples, the Googles, and the super rich. And we are calling for a global tax watchdog to make sure that big companies and the very wealthy people pay their fair share of taxes. We are pushing for living wages for workers. We will not rest until an expectant mother finds support at the workplace not a redundancy letter. Graduates, it is you who must take this fight forward. Each one of you can make your unique contribution towards a larger change. Do not doubt. Young people like you are changing the world. We see them in the tech sector, on social media, in social movements, pushing for change. Be part of them. Don't stand by. We need you to defend our freedoms against autocrats who suppress dissent rather than tackle extreme inequality. Help us to reimagine a world where automation serves all humanity, not only the owners of capital and technology, where it creates millions of jobs, not destroying jobs. Mount St. Vincent University or the Mount, as I was told to call it, has a rich history of challenging the status quo and building responsible global citizens like you all are. You have been trained to find your place in this world. Like Rosa Parks, don't accept the seat you are given. Find your seat on the bus and help others to find theirs too. You've been given the skills through your education to make the world what it should be. Free, equal, just, safe, and prosperous for all. Your professors have inducted you into the Mount's long-standing tradition of women's empowerment and social justice. Oxfam shares this vision with the Mount. So go out. Challenge the toxic idea that extreme inequality is inevitable. It isn't. That extreme wealth is necessary. It isn't. That for some to win, 
many others must lose. That's wrong. Join others to build an economy and communities that value and respect the dignity and rights of every one of us. I'm proud and feel deeply honored to be receiving this degree of Doctor of Human Letters today and to be joining your community. And thank you, Jonathan, for that very generous citation. I look up to you all, the faculty and you, the graduates. I want to be inspired by your spirit and your energy. Let us go. We can make this world fairer and safer for everyone. I thank you very much.